Hello, LA Comic Con. I'm thrilled to be here at my home con, and I'm so honored to be moderating this panel full of talented creatives in the entertainment industry. I say we jump right in and get started. Um, Angela, you're right here. Let's go. Right here. Uh, how did you approach the creative process for Woman Dies Alone as both the film's writer and director? Those of you who live in LA know that you know last year was a little bit of a, a rough year with the dual actor and writer strike. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I really approached it as when it got sort of later in the year, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to let this whole year go by and we haven't done anything, we haven't made anything. So I looked at it as an as a way to work with the best folks I had worked with in the past and just gather the best team I could gather. And it was really a really fun, really cathartic experience. I'm so happy that we did it. We shot it here in LA. It's very um, LA based production. And um, that's rare nowadays. So that's lovely to hear. Jonathan down yonder. Hi. Yes, hello. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Since you were involved with the project from its inception, from the beginning, how did you use music to help shape the tone and the atmosphere of the film? And did any of your musical decisions change the film? Yeah, so uh, anyone who's um, not quite familiar, uh, this is a remake of a cult classic from 1991. So um, the, the original is a very unmistakable, has a very unmistakable uh, late 80s, early 90s vibe, and um, so that that was a big thing that we were trying to recreate. There's this kind of, you know, it's it's kids on summer break, unsupervised, getting into trouble, learning hard lessons, that kind of thing. It's it's like Ferris Bueller's Day Off meets Home Alone meets uh, Dazed and Confused. So that that whole early 90s vibe was we, were, that was really for music the the number one. Uh, mission and that we thought the, the the biggest opportunity for music was to help to uh, capture that same um, that same spirit. And I should mention that the director Wade, Elaine Marcus, and I have been um, we grew up in LA together. We went to high school together, went to college at NYU together. So we've been we've had a collaborative uh, friendship and and working relationship for 20 plus years. And one of the great benefits of that is, you know, I, I got involved, brought into the process probably much earlier than might normally be the case, you know, just working with somebody you don't know as well. And so I got an early, um, I was getting early drafts of the script, even in pre-production before they had the movie fully cast. And I was, I started sending Wade just uh, sketches, um, little vignettes, musical vignettes, things that, that connected for me on some intuitive level, even without any specific scenes in mind. Um, and actually one of the early, um, one of the early pieces of music that I played, which was, was, the, was the music uh, that was in the intro, we called it the overture. I made that during the script phase and that was a, it really helped clarify for Wade and the producers really what the, to the tonal center of the movie was gonna be. Um, and it shifted the conversation away from, you know, maybe we'll do like a kind of 90s style, nostalgic, synth-driven um, kind of score, like sort of like the original, and shifted that into thinking, you know, how we can capture that same spirit of, uh, I guess, innocent mischief uh, of the early 90s, but in our own uh, distinct musical voice. So then that, that piece really ended up being like the guidepost. And, um, and stayed in all the way through the final cut. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, obviously music can and does change the film and ideally it can actually lead to um, insights on the, for the filmmakers and help them really crystallize what it is, what, what, what kind of movie they're trying to make. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a brilliant insight because I know as a writer, I write to music a lot. So why wouldn't you organize your production around music? Sticking on the topic of music, um, Guy, I would love to discuss Ryan's World Titan Universe Adventure with you, since your score combines elements of children's entertainment with adventure and fantasy. So how did you approach balancing the musical themes and styles to create a cohesive and engaging score for the movie? I, I've landed on a process, no matter what project comes up, to, to kind of prepare for, to address this particular issue and hopefully several other issues that uh, producers and directors either require or desire. 
So in preparation, it's um, hopefully I can get some opinion from the director maybe a couple weeks ahead of time. If there's anything in their mind that they're stylistically hoping for or that they've been thinking of or planning on, helps me to whittle down for the next two weeks how to kind of research and, and see what other composers in that genre have done. Um, then there's the spot, which we all go through, well, all the composers anyways. And <clears throat> that's a process of really trying to extract from the director or the producer things like the continuity of the score or uh, sp specific hits or moments in a, in a long arc that he wants to address or she. Um, then there's, so if I get that information under my fingers and into my psyche, it makes the rest of the process really just a creative, uh, really fun and creative to write some music and hand it into the director and see what kind of feedback they can get. So um, I like to make a, a chart of the entire arc of the story. Yeah. So it helps to, if there are particular themes that, that needs to be come up with, it helps to plan out where, where strategically they're gonna be placed and to um, just try to make sense of it on a long arc and then I can cut into the little sections of composition so that we try to address that particular yeah. desire. Um, another essential part of the production process is makeup. It's also an essential part of my daily process. Um, <laughs> JQ, can you elaborate on the process of creating the silicone body doubles for Hold Your Breath? And what unique challenges did you face in designing and constructing these very realistic replicas? Yeah, well, the, the challenge for the film was you can't bury real actors in dirt. They will actually suffocate. Um, so high maintenance. And I know, it's like, it's acting. <laughs> We're going method. And so the filmmakers being highly responsible, um, really amazing, powerful women, called me about a year ahead of time to be like, well, what's involved in creating a silicone body double of someone? And I'm like, oh, 3D scanning. We got to match the hair. We got to match the teeth. We got to match the eyes. You need things to be hair punched. How is this body moving? Where are we finding this body? Um, and so I always hire, I, I love to hire and ask these amazing gentlemen at Autonomous Effects to be my lab when I department head special effects. And it's my job to do the, the actor side um, because a lot of the time the makeup labs and the effects labs have evil geniuses when it comes, like they're amazing effects artists, but they don't necessarily want to work with people, like yeah. on people yeah. all day, every day. So yeah. it's a good collaboration. And those guys just really know what's needed and ask all the right questions. And so part of the challenge is when you hire an actor, like if, you know, if I'm hiring somebody and we're going to find a look, you have to establish a look first before you can make a body double. True. So everybody thinks like, oh, well, we cast the actor, let's go make their double immediately. No, now we gotta find the look. Mm -hmm. And so what's really interesting is in that trailer, the boy whose head is turned and the dust comes out of his mouth, um, that is actually the last piece of this legend of an effects artist and painter, Rich Mayberry. Um, he passed away, I think it was exactly five days after he finished that piece. Um, and, or I should say, you know, tragically he was found then, mm -hmm. but we literally have Rich's last piece of art and it's this articulating body double that was just perfect. He matched the acne on the actor's face. He matched the eyelashes. I mean, every detail. And then, you know, you put something that's hyper realistic and you cover it in dust, right? yeah. <laughs> which immediately makes it look fake. Yeah. And yeah. so we had done all these tests. We, I, we even put like the kid himself was like, that actor was like, oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and lay in the dirt. And I'm like, okay, don't ever do this again for them. Don't ever do this again. Um, <laughs> but you know, we even tried the real actor in the dirt and it, you know, it still looks fake. So it was really great to see the film with the, you know, it premiered on Friday here in LA. It was great to see Rich's last piece of art 
in the film the entire time. They used everything. Right. And you know, when you're gonna do a shotgun blast, sorry, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen, hold your breath, go see it. Sarah Paulson wants you to see it. Um, but you know, if you know, you can blow away someone's face with a shotgun blast, but again, you gotta cover it in dirt. Mm. So it's like, are we gonna put this actor in these huge shotgun blast makeups and take away parts of their head and do green screen and fill all that in with VFX? Or are we gonna build a body that we can do whatever we need to? And so it's like people look at me as a makeup department head and they're like, how did the beauty go for Sarah? And it's like, oh, we could talk about that, you know, <laughs> which is also important where we could talk about all the incredible things that this, you know, autonomous built and all this process of working with a deaf actor as well, you know, and trying to communicate that and blood rigs and all these things. And, and at the end of the day, if it weren't for people like Rich painting bodies to look exactly like you would in real life, I wouldn't be getting so much credit and looking so good as a makeup department head. <laughs> um, and also anything that your actors interact with, you want them to not be taken out of the space. Yeah. You don't want them to lose that mind space. So anything Sarah had to touch, anything the other actors had to touch, it was like, let's just make it as real as possible. I have two directors who want everything to be as practical as possible. Like 110%, let's go for the gold. And I think that's what we got. I hope you guys watch the movie because Rich's bodies are really amazing. Autonomous's bodies are amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a horror person, but now I can't not watch it. And congrats on your premiere. And it must've been a very bittersweet thing with having getting to see rich's work on screen but also knowing that he wasn't there to see it with you yeah exactly so that was great my heart goes out to you trevor d hello um cinematography hello. is such a powerful tool in filmmaking so i want to ask how did you use cinematography to enhance the storytelling in city of dreams and were there any specific scenes where you felt the visuals played a particularly important role Ooh, i mean it, there was a lot of stuff that was really hard in the film. I am um, sprinting through the fashion district with the camera package as streamlined as possible so we can be light and fast, but we're still shooting with like an Alexa Mini and Master Primes, which Master Primes, they're chonkers, so they're, <laughs> they, uh, they take up some space. Um, we had this, there, in the middle portion of the film, there's probably about 12 shots that we stitched together into about a 10 minute one or chase sequence. Whoa. All over the course of probably about two weeks of shooting. Now that's in terms of like lighting, consistency, day, interiors to exteriors, making sure the wipes work for VFX, work, making sure um, continuity between each take so we can use each take. I mean, if we were to come up with a new idea halfway through the one -er, we gotta make sure that that fits continuity wise as a whole and that maybe a secondary character that we just reintroduced. Well, technically in the blocking out of everything, they should have been halfway across the room. That doesn't work anymore. So that was probably one of the toughest things. Um, as a logistical, for as a, a co-cinematographer on the film, I took over for a very talented cinematographer named Alejandro Chavez and he, and the director, Mo, had this kind of vision of keeping the camera lower and cradling rather than typically on your shoulder. Now, nowadays, you know, some people use easy rigs and things like that to keep it low, but we were all completely handheld, just cradle, to kind of give this more innocent view because the main character, if you don't know much about the film, it's about child trafficking. Oh, wow. And the perception of young, young people and young adults looking up at the world and seeing what's going on and having very little power to change it. Um, it also gave us a moment of intimacy in these moments where uh, th there's, there's a bit of romance in the film as well, even in the darkest points of the story. And to have that kind of intimacy of, we, we predom predominantly shot on like an 18 mil, maybe jump to the 35 for some dialogue close-ups. But being that close, being um, that close to their eye level, it, I, I hope that it gave the audience the opportunity to be not only in it with that character, but to kind of experience some of the harsh cruelties that were happening in this film. I don't know if I covered everything. I or, think you did. I think okay. it's fascinating what a small choice, how such a small, seemingly small, subtle choice can have such a big impact on the storytelling visually. 
Absolutely. I mean, Mo, um, the director, he he had pretty much shot the entire film in like a rough iPhone kind of shot list. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was very easy to kind of, um, coming off of Alejandro's style and then his vision for the film to implement that. But very much um, the likes of Caron's kind of work of just intimacy with the camera, feeling the actors, mm -hmm. moving with the, the actors. If you pick up something in their mannerisms, trying to capture that, um, I, lear I learned a lot from both of them on this film. Definitely, I learned a lot from you talking about it. Um, <laughs> Angela, what was your approach? What was your approach for directing *Woman Dies Alone*? Were you more hands-on with your actors, or did you want to give them the space to improvise and ad-lib and all that fun stuff? I had such amazing actors. If anybody's a fan of like *Station 19* or Broadway's mm -hmm. *Fans*, who saw *Groundhog Day*, you know, you know the genius that is Barry Doss. She's spectacular. <laughs> um, so I. Being the writer that I am, <laughs> we spend a lot of time coming up with those words that everybody says. So yes. <laughs> improvisation is not my favorite thing. <laughs> but it's also um, not necessarily hers. Mm -hmm. And so when when you see the film, which um, is still on the festival circuit at the moment, but I'm sure I'll put it online in the next few months, um, it, there are a lot of monologues mm -hmm. involved. And so we, we rehearsed it heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, Lodger Collins also was in it, and he's a fantastic actor from uh, The Oval and uh, wow. some other shows. Um, but during rehearsal, we workshop everything mm -hmm. that's on the page. And so hopefully when they get to set, they don't feel the need to improvise as much. Mm -hmm. I would definitely, if I had unlimited time, I would for sure play around and improvise a little bit more. but. On the smallest budget, it's really not that practical. Yes, and then of course the writer Ray could be like, "You have to say my perfect words." <laughs> <laughs> so Sometimes it's better though. Sometimes every every once in a while, there's an improvis improvisation that improves it. For but, sure, and that's yeah. the job of the director: figuring out which when those moments work or don't. Guy, while the Ryan's World movie is primarily targeted at children, it also explores very universal themes of friendship, teamwork, and over overcoming challenges. So how did you incorporate that emotional depth into the score to connect with audiences of all ages? Well, luckily, the process I mentioned in the first question covers this as well. And it was convenient that this movie was half animation and half live action. So the, a pretty common thing for composers to do in this case is during the live action. And OK, these, these actors, these kids are between let's say, eight years old and 14. Mm. So <clears throat> during the live action part, since it's a, they're just filming, they're kids, they're actors, it's very organic. There's no effects or anything going on. So we decide to kind of use organic music, which would be acoustic instruments, in most cases orchestral, sometimes a very small orchestra, sometimes a bigger one, usually toward the end when you want to raise the uh, stakes so during the animation, it's the same kids in, just in animation form. They jump through a transport from the real world to the animated world. So that's when we can throw in synthesizers and beats and dubstep and all kinds of stuff that doesn't necessarily sound organic or we could com combine it with organic. And that also tends to happen more towards the end when, where the emotion needs to build and that arc in the third act, you know, reaches its peak. So <clears throat> that's pretty much what I followed in the, in the overall storyline that I designed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it worked really well. Yeah, I mean, I love that clip and especially because that was an animated scene and it felt, it sounded as larger than life than it felt. Yeah, and that was the finale. I mean, yeah. It went for a little longer, but. <laughs> <laughs> I still, you get the gist and it's like, I, I want to go back and see how we got there. Um, Trevor, what specific camera and lighting techniques, uh, in addition to the ones you s walked us through uh, in City of Dreams, did you create to execute your director's visual style? And were there any particular challenges or innovations involved in doing so? Because I think it's fascinating that you took over from another cinematographer. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it is, when you take over for another cinematographer or any department role, 
your r responsibility is always to the service of what the director's vision is and continuing the work of the previous cinematographer. Now, I was lucky to start on the production as the second unit director of photography mm -hmm. and be camera operator on main unit. So right from the beginning in our day one on L in the LA unit, I was learning from both Alejandro and Mo on how they wanted to shape this film. So once I was brought back in post COVID for the pickups and reshoots, I had already some chemistry with Mo mm -hmm. and I also knew the look and feel for what he's going for. Now that doesn't mean you can't break off and still you're, you're your own artist and you still need to create to your own, what, what you feel is your own taste. Um, and still servicing the director in that time. So there's obviously going to be different ways of lighting. You skin a cat mul multiple different ways. But um, at the end of the day, it's always still about servicing the director and trying to maintain continuity between the shots that sometimes, I mean, some of these shots we did were at the end of 2018, and then I'm doing pickups in 2021, 2022. And so talent gets a little older. Um, the locations might have gotten burned down or maybe the sets are, you know, uh, not quite there anymore. So you have to recreate that to the best of your ability and mimic the lighting that you remembered from four plus years ago, but try to make it fit as seamless as possible. So it, it was a challenge, but um, I'm super grateful for the opportunity. Yeah, it seems like you you stitched it all together beautifully. And as someone who also worked on a film that had a COVID break where child actors got older, it's a tricky <laughs> needle to thread, so I bow yes. down, <laughs> especially because we were just thinking about what scenes we're going to do rather than like you making sure it looks good and everyone can see each other's faces. Um, Jonathan, how did you adapt the film's score for different release platforms, like uh, traditional theatrical release versus streaming, which I find fascinating that there would even be adaptation. Were there any specific considerations or adjustments made for each format? So at, at the at the outset of the project, we actually did not know we were going to get a theatrical release. Um, the The assumption was direct to streaming. Maybe maybe we would get a limited theatrical release, ten theaters for some period of time, and that would have been a great outcome. You know, that's what the assumption was going into it. Um, and then as we got further down the line, you know, going from the director's cut to the producer's cut. Um, and we started to screen it for more people. The studio, BET, got more excited about it. Then they, they did a test screening for the, um, the distributor, Iconic, and, that, and then that went well. So by the time we, we, we had a locked cut, uh, the decision was made to push a, a, a wide release, which was, uh, I don't know exactly how many theaters, but it was at least 1,500 or so. So that, Congratulations. Obviously. Yeah, that's like yeah, miraculous, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That really speaks to the quality of work on this film. Yeah, it was a journey, and I mean, it was that was obviously an exciting development, and, and but it also raised expectations a little bit um, and upped the ante for the music, too. So, so where, as, basically, the main, the main consideration at that point was making sure we had um, the, uh, the music was fit for a theater audience and for uh, and so that was we hired a uh, brought on a, a veteran score mixer who mixed it in uh dolby atmos uh, surround and then we also had we got a very experienced music editor who helped to kind of finesse the ins and outs and the sync points and all that so those are some of the considerations but in terms of streaming and this is kind of just a more of maybe a, a general um, audio mastering uh, note, but something that I always do, and I did on this movie, I do always is, I I always listen to my mixes on my phone, and I oh. uh, and and watch whatever I put music in. I watch it the scene on my phone, um, and that's just in recognition of the fact that there's probably a lot of people who are going to be watching and listening to your stuff on the phone and right. streaming, and 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 it's uh, obviously it's not. Um, it's not an ideal, it's not the best sonic uh, environment, but you still want to make sure, you know, like, I, if, if, I, if I play it on the phone and it sounds okay, good, if, if something's missing, then I go back and tweak, because you want the, um, you know, you want the, the essence of the music to still come across even uh, at the, the lowest common denominator format, so. For sure, and I think there's so, we have so much content now fighting for the everyone's collective attention, so if someone does pick your 
movie to stream, you want them to get the best experience possible. That makes perfect sense. And that's a really great tip, by the way. Um, JQ. Uh, I want to know more about the makeup and SFX work on the horror short film Posies, which was scored by pop sensation Chapel Rowan. Not sure if you know who she is. She's only the biggest thing right now. Um, And also, Posies will be released on October 10th, so the countdown's on. I want to hear all about it. Yeah, that was great. We made Posies in 2019, actually, in in New Orleans in the wintertime. And if you're into body horror, you know, like if you're a horror fan at all, and then you go into body horror, which is very specific. Um, and there's a film out right now that I won't mention it at, you know, just in case, you know, but I, <laughs> yeah, the substance, yeah. the substance, like, you know, if you're into that, the uh, creators, R.H. Davis and um, Kate are actually a duo. And oh, cool. she, R- Rachel R.H. Davis is an exorcist by profession. And so, She has a novel out, um, Sister of Darkness, I believe is what it's called. And essentially, Posies is recreating one of her visions. And so what you see in it is a high concept beauty look on this stunning ethereal actress, Anna Diop. Um, she's, She's incredible. And, you know, not to give too much away, you also get to see the monster and the monstrosity behind humans and human beings. And creating Rachel's visions is terrifying. <laughs> uh, just the fact that she, her work states that these are things and entities that she deals with, you know, is kind of a daunting task when you're doing that through makeup and visual storytelling. And so I don't want to give too much away, even though Posies has been released before, they are re releasing it. Um, for the Halloween season because I want people to be surprised by it, but I highly recommend you check it out because you're you're not really going to expect. I mean, you can try to think of everything. You're not going to expect what comes. And the music, you know, just to go with what these two, you know, gentlemen do, um, Chapel Rowan, before people knew her as a pop icon and she had been turned down from one record label, had started doing soundtracks for some filmmakers when she found you know, their script's interesting, and she found Rachel's work very interesting, and Rachel's like, nobody knows who this girl is, and she is going to be huge, and which goes along the lines of what Rachel does, exorcism, premonitions. Yeah, those you instincts know. are right on. <laughs> you know, she and she, I remember her telling me, just wait, just wait until you hear the music, and it, it does not sound like what you know of her. It is very leading and haunting, and leads the story, and leads the visuals, leads the cinematography, and leads you know and then I'm the one that like finishes it off and gives it a bang you know so you know you're looking at this stunning masterpiece um anti I I can't remember the DP's name at the moment I'm so sorry about this anti I apologize dude but he had some incredible cinematography that looked like tableaus and paintings and all this gorgeous color in the lighting and lighting is something I'm very passionate about when it comes to makeup, it can make or break things. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to have the soundtrack and score Mm -hmm. to the film prior to making it. Oh, cool, I didn't know, yeah. Yeah, so that we could hear, you know, what the the film, the short was gonna sound like. Never underestimate a short. Like, I've had shorts be on the Oscar shortlist, proof of concepts, like never underestimate a short. And that is some of like the highest conceptual makeup you can find because it goes from like a really stylized beauty makeup to full-on full-blown special effects yeah that's amazing and vfx and again i keep working for directors and writers who want things to be as practical as possible so like what you see in both of these projects is like mostly very practical married beautifully with the vfx and then the music just tops it off and so uh, posies october 10th and you know watch out for rh davis because she's got some things in production and you're about to see a lot of body horror. Gird your loins, everyone. But it sounds, <laughs> does sound like the ultimate spooky season watch and at least it's a short so I could all, I'll only be scared for X amount of minutes. Um, <laughs> I have a, my next question is for everyone. So I say we start with Trevor and work our way down. Cool. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers or technicians who are interested in a career in post-production? Oh, yeah. That's something I... Hope to answer. Um, 
Well, obviously, the industry is definitely going through a lot right now. I mean, it's it's a huge shift in terms of uh, what people are watching on, um, be it their phones, TVs, tablets, um, but also the the attention span. And so, I I, I actually think it's a great time to get in, um, and at the very beginning, if you're if you're aspiring to be a cinematographer, I think just just shoot just shoot as much as you can if it's even just some directors or friends and on the weekends grab a camera no matter what kind of camera that is and just try to shoot learn your composition study the people and the cinematographers you like um, and take screenshots of their work study the framing study the reasons why they moved the camera or didn't move the camera i mean all the technical gack that you can have it's great but that's not what's going to make you a cinematographer understanding a story understanding how to progress and tell a story through your work it doesn't have to be a probe lens or some super fancy camera move because does that really serve the story you so i think uh, going all the way back learning how to tell a story and understand how to read a story from a script and implement that is probably one of the biggest tools you can have if you want to be a cinematographer. Um, everybody, I, not everybody, but there's a lot of people out there that can make pretty images, but it it goes beyond that sometimes when you're trying to tell the story. Um, so yeah, just, just practice, shoot, get on in as many sets as possible. If you're not working full time as a cinematographer, hop on and be an AC or a camera assistant and, or an operator in other shoots so you can see how other DPs work, see how they light see how they move the camera, and if you like that, maybe you can implement that into your own work. Um, but it's all about just the reps and doing as many reps as possible. That's great advice. Jonathan? As a composer, I guess I, I try to look at this thing as a, a very long game, and that, um, you know, I look at John Williams, and he's 92, and he's still working, um, and that gives me some comfort and also inspires me in that, you know, this is knock on wood, uh, potentially a 30, 40, 50 year journey ahead. And right. kind of think in that scope, it, it definitely gives you a, a bigger sense of what's possible. And, and, um, and it allows you to kind of realize that the, the learning and the evolving hopefully never stops. And mm -hmm. you're always tr working on, on getting better at di different aspects of the craft. Um, so that's one thing. Um, great yeah I, I, I'll, I had another thing but I'll leave it there <laughs> <laughs> we should all aspire to be like John Williams who's practicing his craft in his yeah, 90s yeah. <laughs> what about you JQ um, I mean there's always a lot of tips on you know like study this look at that but I think what's more important is the human aspect of film um, especially as AI starts to take over our jobs the few, the few humans left you really need to learn how to work with and read really well and I think my biggest advice when it comes to joining any field in the film industry is like be prepared to celebrate each other. Mm -hmm. I think I the reason that you have inspiration, that you have a mentor, that you have work that you love is because you in your mind celebrated the work of an amazing artist at some point in time. And so as you become a professional in the industry, as you start in the industry, I have found, especially on my path, that give credit where credit is due but like really be willing and ready to celebrate other people's amazing work, especially as you start to figure out how it's done. It doesn't matter where it is. And that makes the people and the human aspect side of it um, more connective. And the more willing you are to put yourself out there as somebody who raises other people up and is like, damn, that was a really, really great job. The more you realize that those people gravitate towards you because yeah. competition's fun and all, but it's not sustainable in every field. Especially this one, since we're a collaborative art. Right, and AI is gonna out-compete I'll know. watch the body horror, don't talk about AI to me. So, uh, yeah, the people. That's, a, that's another panel. <laughs> yeah. So celebrate, celebrate people, celebrate the human. That's, I'm obsessed with that advice. Uh, what about you, Guy? First thing would be to have a serious conversation with yourself about if you're willing to put in the time, effort, the emotion in this industry, you'll be competing with people who don't mind working 20 hours a day, every day of the week for months at a time. Don't underestimate, there's no such concept as 
you, you have too much information in your mind or you've, you've been too educated. Tool up and learn as much as you can, whether it's official courses or studying other people in your profession. And thirdly, uh, nothing happens in this industry without a relationship. Now, you might start a relationship or you may be introduced to somebody on a project, but continuing with that person or expanding or having that person recommend you to the next and you start to grow a tree of connection is only on relationship. Um, it's assuming that you've tooled up and you can add something creatively to the process. But if that relationship doesn't connect on a project, not, yeah. nothing expands. And That's very true. This, this whole industry is relationships. Um, what about you, Angela? Yeah, I'm going to uh, almost redux all of these answers. Um, Megamix. <laughs> yeah, I've got a Megamix. Um, because when you look around this giant convention hall, like at the end of the day, just story is such a very basic part of the human experience. And so it is rooted in our humanity um, in a way that I don't think AI is ever going to be able to touch. Agree. And so the people <laughs> that you want to connect with are already like around you or in your circle. They're close to you. Um, so the, the idea of networking is not really like figuring out who's already doing it. It's finding the people around you who share that passion mm -hmm. and getting specific about the, the piece of the puzzle, the, the piece of this collaborative puzzle that is yours. Mm -hmm. Get specific about that, get great at that, and you'll fall right into place with other people who are passionate about their piece of that collaborative puzzle. And, um, That's great advice. That's great advice, and if I could add any insight as a writer who I feel like sometimes I'm on the diametric opposite side of the production process, I think it's still important to, as, even as a writer, even when you're dreaming up the scenes, to know and be able to speak post-production, even if you only are conversationally post-production, because it's only going to facilitate better work from all these amazing, amazing artisans. If, especially if you're a writer like me who wants to produce their own work or direct their own work like Angela, it's important to know, because we are a collaborative medium, how to speak to a cinematographer and a composer and your makeup head and everyone in between. Um, to make to execute your vision, right? Because we all sit alone in our dark rooms on our laptop, laptop <laughs> dreaming up stories. But it's the making of the story and knowing how that actually is executed that separates you from your dark room and you from the red carpet. So um, what I want to I'm going to start with Angela, and then we're going to go the opposite way, quickly, rapid fire. What's next for you? What's next for you all? And is there anything that you're working on that you can share with us? Um, I don't know how at liberty I am to talk about, but it's a Christmas movie at Netflix. It's very exciting. You'll see it next Yay. week, probably. I like it. Yay! <laughs> I have Butch Hartman's The Garden cartoon for little kids. It's a Bible-based uh, cartoon. And uh, we just heard a, a series that I did the first, scored the first season for John Lake was on. was called The Green Veil. It got picked up for a second season. Nice. Congrats. That's yes. probably yeah. a year away. <laughs> Um, I have A24 film Opus, which be on the lookout for. Um, Ayo Itibiri, I hope I said her last name right, um, is the lead, and John Malkovich is starring in that with her, and that's going to be wow, nice and weird, crazy. really, really nice and weird. Yeah. <laughs> also, kind of body horror. And um, well, so There's a theme, and it's weird <laughs> by JQ, and I love it. I make them pretty, <laughs> then I mess them up. Um, and then I'm about to leave on Friday to go do another A24 film, which I am not at liberty to speak about because I am NDA'd yeah. intensely, but... Great problem to have, you know. Director of King <laughs> Kong is he's going to be our director. So, you know, Adam and I'm just like, all right, let's go kill some more people. <laughs> <laughs> Only in this context can that get applause. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> so I, I just recently finished up the final mix on a totally different kind of movie, also a feature. Um, it's called... The interesting title, I Don't Love You Anymore. It's like a, it's a, a psychological Rashomon-style thriller uh, told through the series of 
police interrogations and flashbacks, so very, very different from high school parties and fashion shows, um, <laughs> but fun to get into that headspace, and so that'll, you know, that, that's coming down the pike. And also Wade um, has a couple of uh, uh, TV projects in development early, um, you know, making their way through the, uh, making its way down the pipeline, one, an anthology series about uh, youth movements uh, throughout history cool. and around the world, starting with the 1963 Birmingham Children's March, and um, and then another workplace drama, historical fiction about um, the music magazine Fader uh, in mm, er, early in, yeah, New York, early 2000s. So that's going to be cool. Yeah, very exciting. Lots of exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, yeah, I, I it's I'm in a fun period where I'm in pre-production for a feature that'll probably be starting shooting at the beginning of next year. While I'm also heavily in post-production for a couple features um, and a few shorts on top of that, so it's 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 a fun juggle right now when you're like going through camera tests for what you're about to shoot, and then you're looking through footage of something that you already did shoot. Um, and so uh, I'm sitting. I want to be more on set right now, but it's in a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, color sessions, but it's still fun. We, we, we push through those to get to the fun on set. They're still fun. Yeah, no, yeah. they're still fun. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today with these amazing creators. Thank you so much to our panelists, Angela, Guy, JQ, Jonathan, and Trevor, for being here with us today to discuss their outstanding creative work and thank you to impact 24 pr and los angeles comic-con for putting this panel together and to all of you for coming on a sunday afternoon to talk shop um also be sure to follow us on social media at impact 24 pr uh, to watch this panel again just because i think there's a lot of good advice here so in case anyone forgot their notepad it will be up online soon watch this space and then you can also get more behind the scenes news on your favorite projects Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for nerding out with us. Yeah. <laughs>